The following presentation was recorded at the 2013 Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors in 2013 for helping make these videos possible. Okay, excellent, thank you. Good morning. How many woke up this morning, show of hands? <laughs> we'll wake the rest of you up before you're done. Um, my name is Russ Pavlicek. This is hopefully the talk you came to see. Otherwise, it's going to be very interesting for you. So who's the old fat geek up front? Me. I've been around for a long time, and I've got a great big mouth, which is why I'm here. Uh, Here's the short form. I've been dealing with Linux since 95. I've had a Linux desktop since 97. Um, I wrote a column long time ago for in <laughs> and I deafen people regularly. Not sure where that came from. Um, Processor Magazine. Used to be a regular on the Linux show webcast. Anyone remember the Linux show? One. Uh, closest thing right now is Linux Link Tech Show, and uh, I was actually on that um, a week and a half ago. So, uh, if you okay, yeah, that's the NSA. Okay, um, so if you actually, uh, if you go to Linux Link Tech Show, which is T L L T S dot org, uh, episode five hundred seven, I was on there, and they let me roll for ninety minutes. So if uh, uh, if you like what I'm saying today, you can find more there. So I've, I've been around. I was actually in the open source world for several years at the beginning and then got swallowed into the abyss of closed source for a few years. So I have, en I have exited purgatory and have returned to the light. Um, and uh, as I mentioned to uh, some of you who are here, uh, I started with Citrix in January. I've never been to a Citrix office. And uh, my job is you folks, basically, is uh, talking with the open source community and dealing with the open source project team. There is a second talk uh, that I'm doing Sunday afternoon. Um, that is a more Zen technical type talk. If you're interested in Zen or you want to know more about Zen, that's the talk to go to. Uh, we're going to talk about the architecture, some of the current good stuff that's coming along inside the project and some of the stuff that's coming up. So if you, if you want the technical lowdown, 245 Sunday, we'll go into that. That's not what this talk is about. This talk, I'm going to spend a couple of minutes just sort of acclimating to the project because I don't know how much uh, time people or how much stuff people know about Zen. Uh, then we'll spend a few minutes just discussing history of Zen, Zen project. But we're going to try to spend the bulk of the time on takeaway. In other words, what were the lessons that we can learn for any project based on some of the things that have happened with Zen Project? Um, so that's what I'm here for today. That's what this session is going to be. It's going to be focusing on what does it take to keep, that, to keep any project viable based on uh, what we've seen. So what is Zen Project? Premier open source hypervisor. And if you don't believe that, I can point you to the website and we'll use exactly that phrase. Um, we power some of the biggest clouds in the industry. See some of them up there, Rackspace Open Cloud, Amazon, if you're an Amazon user, you're a Zen user. That's just the way it is. Terramark uh, just announced a, uh, a big cloud thing that's all Zen based. Uh, so there's a bunch of stuff out there. We're on our 10th anniversary. Zen is not a, a newbie thing by any stretch of the imagination. And about six weeks ago, we announced that it is now part of uh, Linux Foundation as a collaborative project, a really big deal for us. And um, in case you don't think people care about Zen, just look at some of the charter organizations that signed on at the time. Uh, all of these have a stake in seeing the Zen project grow strong. So, I mean, that was actually a really cool event, and it's a good thing to have happened because, as we'll see, there's been some discussion about whether Zen is really open source, et cetera, et cetera, and we're, we're clearing that out right now. So Linux Foundation, great stuff there. What does it produce? Zen Hypervisor. Most people, I'm sure, have at least heard of that, uh, including 
ARM servers. We'll, we'll talk about that a little bit more in depth in the Sunday talk, but uh, that's actually very exciting. It is a type one hypervisor, and we'll talk more about this in Sunday, but type one means it, it runs on the bare metal. It is not an instance sitting either in the kernel or in user space to create a virtual machine. That's not the way it works. It actually runs on the metal, and then you have, uh, then you have uh, OS running in it. So it's a, it's a bit different in that regard, and that's also an advantage uh, that we can talk about a little bit later. But um, we also have things like Zen Cloud Platform and Zappy, uh, as it is sometimes called. Basically, it's cloud out of the box. Um, it's designed that way. In fact, one of the really interesting things is if, if you go back to some of the earliest documents relating to Zen, some of the earliest design documents in the late 90s when they're just talking about the concept, they actually talk about a cloud concept. It was engineered for that before the term cloud was ever adopted. So it was, it was really breaking new ground at the time. It was, it was very interesting. There are some sub-projects, too, that once again, Sunday, if you're interested, come back and we'll talk a little bit more about. The Mirage project, which has to do with these teeny tiny little dedicated VMs that do marvelous things. And, uh, and then the uh, ARM hypervisor for mobile devices. You know, it's like, you know, someone said, well, why would you want virtualization on something like this? Well, you know, I am old enough that uh, when I went to college, uh, right after the Earth's surface cooled, uh, this, this would have been like not more computing power than the entire campus had, but several orders of magnitude more computing power than the campus had. Uh, really amazing. So I think that, uh, you know, if you can't think of a use case for this having virtualization, it's because well, I've heard a couple proposed, but I think there's going to be a killer use case that no one has actually thought about, because no, no one thinks about it. I mean, who thinks about doing this? Well, some people are, and we're going to see something interesting come out of this. We, you may have a cloud in your pocket before long. I think it could get kind of weird, but it could be really interesting. So what's the Zen Project story, the 30-second version? It was the first industrial-strength open-source hypervisor. Woo-hoo! Very high rate of adoption, initially. Excellent technology. No one's ever really knocked the technology. It had, at the time, a, an open source friendly corporation behind it, ZenSource. And yet, if you looked at the status of things two years ago, it was at the risk of being basically forgotten in the open source world. Now, you know, this can leave you shaking your head. It had everything going for it. And yet, it almost became a footnote in open source history. How did this happen? The project was viable. It was doing good stuff. It has good stuff. But it started sort of developing an inward focus. It wasn't really doing all that it needed to do on all levels to reach out beyond itself. The reach out to the open source community was limited. There was some stuff going on. But, you know, based on, on what I'm actually hearing from firsthand from people, they're saying, we didn't hear it like we're hearing it now. Reach out to the user base was minimal, and that's, that's one that, frankly, we're still trying to work on, because Zen is, you know, very intensely, you know, down low. It's, you know, kind of kernel-ish. You know, you're dealing with stuff running on metal. But that user connection was still fairly minimal. Code development was good. But the community itself sort of seemed to develop an inward focus. No one was stepping up when rumors started to spread about Zen's demise. You didn't hear a lot inside the Linux slash open source slash trade press saying, no, no, no. We're here and we're standing. So there was this cocoon that seemed to be building to a certain extent. The project seemed to forget the importance of working fully within its ecosystem. You have things like upstream projects, the kernel, QMU, they were being uh, branched rather than, uh, rather than having the patches going in. Because the, uh, 
the kernel and QMU had to be enabled for certain things in Zen, so they were branched, they branched those projects, but somehow those patches weren't getting back into the mainstream. What, what does that mean? That means that other parts of the ecosystem, like the distributions, then had to compensate. How many people remember, you know, whether you used it or not, when you'd, you'd, you'd crack open your CD, your Linux CD, and there'd be a Zen kernel in there? Remember that? Yeah, no more. That's because, for a while, those important kernel patches weren't going back into the kernel, so you needed a specially patched kernel to, to play with Zen. And so the distributions were the ones, a lot of the time, that had to deal with the care and feeding of these things. That's a lot to ask. And it went on too long, and frankly, these other parts of the ecosystem that had to feed this got fed up. Because you'll carry that weight for a little while, but after a while, you have to play well with others. Then the corporation backing it, ZenSource, was sold to a closed source corporation. Well, it's not the end of the planet, but that means that things change. And the new corporation, of course, liked the technology, but it sure wasn't an open source corporation. It, you know, and all indications are it didn't really know what to do with this project that it inherited. So the bottom line is not about malice. No one was trying to kill Zen. It's not about fear, it was about disconnection. And that's the point I'm gonna be working with a little bit here. First, the project was disconnected from you folks. There are people going out and doing some talking a little bit here and a little bit there, but by and large, not nearly as much as needed to be done. The project became disconnected from its users. It wasn't getting all the feedback it needed about what was going right or wrong. And then the new company and the project had its own sense of disconnection. And you know, I, in fact, uh, I was at Texas Linux Fest last week, and someone was asking about the problems that you know Canonical Ubuntu were going through. Every open source company and project combination has to figure out what to do. And, this, and the solution, I'm uh, convinced, is gonna be different in every case, just slightly at least. So there is this wrestling that has to happen. There is this sanity check that has to happen. And for a long time, the Citrix uh, relationship was not resolving itself the way it should. And the clicker is not doing what it should be doing. Two years ago, this is more or less the status of what things look like. Prognosis wasn't very good. Hi the Zen hypervisor had been overtaken in mindshare by commercial interests, VMware. You know, commercial company doing what a commercial company should do, it's blowing its horn. It was also overshadowed by another open source offering, KVM. And once again, they were doing what they were doing. You know, there, there wasn't any issues about that. They were doing what they should be doing. Distributions stopped facilitating Zen, or at least were considering stopping it. Uh, most notable, of course, has been the, the latest edition of uh, Red, Hat, Red Hat Enterprise Linux. You know, they've gone on the KVM, uh, they've invested in the KVM technology and they've made a business decision to go that way. But also other distributions were following suit. And the, f and the open source community be just began to forget. Zen became yesterday's news. And about two years ago, people at Citrix decided, you know what? Something's gotta change. This has to be rescued. This has to be brought in, into the fore again. But we don't know how to do this. It's actually one of the smartest decisions they could do. They went ahead and they actually went out and they found people who understood open source and said, help us fix this. You know, <laughs> I'll tell you, I wish more companies would do that. That is actually, that's one of the brightest things that you can do when you're, you're dealing with it. And so they brought people in and the net effect is that there are several originally Citrix-based ownings which have now gone into the open source arena and I don't think we're done yet. But Apache Cloud Stack, You'll hear some of those guys here today. Uh, 
you know, that came out of cloud.com. That was a Citrix-owned uh, 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 technology. Open Daylight just announced about a month ago. Um, interesting things going on there. And then, of course, the move of, of uh, Zen Project to Linux Foundation. So all these things have come about in, say, the past couple of years in order to play well within the open source community. And this clicker is driving me nuts. Just sing something while I'm trying to get this straight. <laughs> okay, the clicker has now officially lost its mind. Good, now let's try to get this right. Two years ago, Lars Kurth, community manager for Zen said, these were the things he used to hear when he would go to uh, meetings like this. What's Zen? Zen's dead, right? Isn't that closed source now? It was bought by some company, it's closed source, and no one uses Zen anymore. You know, these, these were the things that were absolutely normal for him to hear. Frightening, but normal. And today is very different. Right now, with the Linux 3.0 kernel, everything that you need to facilitate Zen is in the mainstream kernel. The era of the Zen kernel is dead because it's part of Linux now. Most distributions are now Zen enabled again. Big exception is RHEL. Uh, but even then, uh, actually I was talking to uh, one of the CentOS guys who was involved with this just last week in Texas. Uh, there's a CentOS project underway to try to refit Zen into CentOS. So that if you happen to be working on a RHEL Zen stack with RHEL 5, and you don't want to go to KVM in RHEL 6, you might soon be able to migrate to CentOS 6 Zen instead. Very interesting uh, uh, project indeed. But that's the CentOS guys, they are going ahead and doing that, and I think that's great. So I said Zen Project's part of the Linux Foundation, and we've got a new website. How many people have been to zenproject.org, the new website? I'm not letting you out of the room <laughs> until, until you go there. <laughs> But please take a look at that. Uh, th that was one of the first tasks I had when I got on board uh, working with Zen, is that we knew we had to birth this website. If you've been to the, have you been to the old zen.org, anyone? How would you characterize the old zen.org? Uh, forgettable. forgettable. It looks like it's 10 years old, and it really is developer focused, you know? I mean, uh, that's really, it's kind of an exchange of highly technical information, but not really a good place for that person that says, hey, I want to learn about this project to come. Zenproject.org, we're trying, we're trying to have that information available for the developers, but by the same token, we want something that everyone else can read. So please, 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 please go there, sign up for an account, we won't spam you with email. Just sign up for an account, we're gonna have some good stuff coming real soon there, uh, but, uh, and please give us feedback. Please give me feedback, nothing else. You know, you don't want to use the form, send me email. Uh, I just want to know what, that we're hitting the mark here or what we have to add or change or whatever, so please, it's really important. But that's part of the thrust, is that we want to be good members of the open source community. So what have we learned through all this? This is really the heart of the talk. Lesson one, it's possible to die while you're winning. You know, it's not one of those things that you think about too often. But being first is not enough. Zen was pretty well first in what it was doing. Great technology is not enough. Um, let's see, let's see how many people have gray hairs in the temple. Windows 3.1. Yeah. IBM had something else. What was the something else called? OS2. Warp, warp. How many people think 3.1 was vastly superior to OS2? Show of hands. None. <laughs> and that is about the general consensus of the world. Which one won in the marketplace? Windows. If that was the only illustration I had, it would be enough. But if you go back in the history of software, the greatest ideas don't always rise to the top. So even if you just have a blisteringly great concept, don't assume that that's all you need.
to make a splash, to make a difference in the world. And having a open source friendly corporation isn't enough. Zen had that. But things change. We'll talk about that in a minute. The project itself has to stay vibrant as a community. It has to stay vibrant as an organization, as an organism, in order to succeed. If you are disconnected from your users, you can be the walking dead. You can be adding functionality, issuing releases, doing all sorts of great stuff. But if you haven't connected with your users properly, you may be on the way out and you don't realize it. The connection is essential, and the focusing on the software alone is not sufficient. I mean, you know, we're geeks. We like playing with the bits. It's fun. It's a rush. But we've got to remember to reach out and find out how people are using our bits. Because you know, in the open source world, of course, we're not looking about, well, we've got to have profits and all this. No, not necessarily. But you want to have people using what you code. You want to have people say, hey, this was cool. It solved my problem. Thank you. If you're there, you're good. But if you don't know, you may be, you may be two nights' work from giving them something terrific, and instead they're not touching your code. You have to reach out and you have to have that connection. So if you're not interaction, interacting with your users in some ways, you're at risk. Also, and this is very Zen-ish, reaching out to your developers is not the same thing as reaching out to your users. You may be doing pretty well as far as your project team. You know, you got people all over the world or however it's happening. But you need to do more than just facilitate your developers. That's fine when you're in an alpha stage, you know, and people aren't really trying to use your code yet. But you have to progress. You're going to issue something that users can use, you've got to be talking to your users. If they're digging through a whole bunch of technical goop to get to the user information, you're missing something. Once again, as geeks, it would be really, really nice if you didn't have to worry about that. But that's actually where you're going to learn as you develop that stuff. You're going to learn what they need. And that's, a, that's really important for your survival. And even the Linux kernel, you know, I mean, you think about it, when people use Linux, they're normally talking about the stacks of stuff on top of Linux. You could argue that the Linux kernel is sort of insulated from users. But even still, if you look at the way the, the kernel's had to develop, it has to be aware of what users need. It may not get you know, that, that really tight connection that some you know, like, you know, GUIs and stuff do. But any, any project, you've got to have that user connection. Lesson three, never ignore the root structure. You know, I, I've, I've used this, this imagery for years. How many business people, particularly you know, about 15 years ago, say, all oh, this open source stuff, you know, the technology is great, but you got all this ugly community. Just, let's just get rid of all this ugly community stuff, and we'll have something that's really beautiful. That's the cut flower syndrome, man. Cut flowers are gorgeous for about three days, and then you throw them away, because they're dead. Community needs roots, because it's alive. If you don't have roots, and roots get ugly, Fact of life, if you don't have those roots, you're going to die. So you must foster your roots. And that roots has to do with the community, and the project team can't stand alone. So pay attention, identify your partners. I mean, if you've got some little widget that's just sitting there and it's, you know, kind of like the quickie calculator, you know, um, BC or something, you know. You can kind of say, well, that's my universe, it's pretty small. But every other, you know, all these more elaborate projects, you're, you have libraries, you have distributions. It's like, who's feeding you? Are you talking to them? Are they giving you what you want? Will they continue to give you what you want? Talk to them. Be involved with what, with what they're doing, you know? You've got, your, you've got the kernel issues, if it's, if it's lower level, kind of like Zen is. If you've got packaging issues. Now, how many times have you said, oh, wow, you know, look, at this, look at this new project I just found. This is cool. I'm going to download this thing. Next thing you know, you go, to, you go to install it, and it's like, 
crap, I have to, I have to upgrade to three levels higher in GNOME, and I have to bring, bring in a whole bunch of stuff that's, that's in the alpha stage over here, and you know, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to redline my system here, just trying, to, just trying to get this thing going. You know, if we're not talking with the other members of the ecosystem and giving, giving out things that can be used by real honest-to-God people and not everyone li li leading at the uh, bleeding edge, we're not going to do so well. So you've got to be aware, mindful of your libraries and, and the other things that feed you and play well with them. Don't ignore your support structure. In Zen's case, a lot to do with distributions. Distributions had to play well, and we loaded them down with too much. Once again, if you have something that you can just take up in a tarball and go, and it just installs, great. But if you're a project that has any more complexity, you've got to play well. Are you, you know, do you have the right libraries and stuff that are going to be usable there and so forth? So packaging becomes real important. Is it available? Is the, is the guy on Red Hat going to have the same easy experience that the guy on Ubuntu, Ubuntu does for installation? If you want to get out there and have things used, you have to be able to address that question. If it can be done, great. If it's not being done, you've got to find a solution. <coughs> In the case of Zen particularly, you had Red Hat sort of saying, well, we're going to do the KVM stuff, and the hell with Zen. We're not even going to facilitate it anymore. Business decision, their choice. And as a result, for a while, some of the other distributions were saying, yeah, why not? We don't want to do the work either. And if, if people are moving away from it, we don't want to invest the time. So you could find yourself in that situation. You want to make sure you stay on top and, not, and have, have your friends and make sure you're playing well with your distributions or other, any other thing. So that distribution route can be absolutely critical depending on the type of project that you're working on. Having corporate backing isn't enough, you know, because any, any situation, whether it's uh, open source friendly or not, the corporation has goals going this way, the project has goals going this way. Fact of life. Why? Because corporations have to make money. They got to do things. They've got business goals. The project has project goals. If, if it's really, really good, you know, they might be more or less going in the same direction but there are always going to be differences, and those always have to be resolved. You've got to make sure that you understand each other's goals and you're facilitating each other's goals. And that doesn't matter whether you're, whether you're Red Hat or whether you're the Abyss, you know, Oracle, whatever. I don't know. Sorry about that to any Oracle people. Uh, you know, because, I mean, th that, that's one instance that, you know, a lot of people aren't too happy with some of the things going on there. They're making their decisions they're living with. If you want better, you gotta do better. And it's not about good versus evil. It's about business goal, project goal. And that's why you can't have the dysfunction between them. You have to figure out what it takes to get them both together. Having an open source company behind you is no guarantee. You know, some people think that's the brass ring. You've got, you've got this open source friendly company behind you, all's gonna be right with the world, right? Well, open source companies can be sold, or they can go under, or any number of other things. And that's what happened with Zen. They went from having a you know, very open source friendly company, suddenly one of the classic old closed source companies. Wow, you know, big change. Some open source companies go a gentler route. You know, remember JBoss was on its own, Gluster was on its own, they're all part of Red Hat now, one big happy family, et cetera, et cetera. But that doesn't always happen that way, you know? MySQL, Zen. I listed Cassad. I used to work for a company called Cassad that probably no one has ever heard of. It was a startup that used to consume a lot of open source company, actually did some terrific stuff about cloud infrastructure, um, even before the term cloud was used. Um, and it was open source friendly and we were kept debating, you know, some of us were hoping that the open, they would open source some of the product, didn't happen. Then, uh, then during the banking crisis of five years ago, our 11 and a half run month runway became three weeks. And we got the phone call, it's like, well, you have a job but you don't have a paycheck. And we're trying to sell off uh, 
such as we have. And so they sold off some of the assets and the human compatible liveware to a company that was even more classic old so uh, closed source and a company where I swear the lawyers probably had a picture of Richard Stallman dressed in a devil suit with a pitchfork used as a dartboard on the wall. They were scared to death of the GPL and anything to do with open source. Just petrified. So you went from a situation where there was an open source sensitivity to just nothing. Um, that can happen. That can happen, especially in the open source world, because when you consider open source companies, you know, the business model for open source companies is cast firmly in jello. You know, Red Hat's done about the best job of it, but when push comes to shove, it's kind of rough. It is so much simpler to say, we own this stuff, and if you want this stuff, you come to us and you pay for it. Classic closed source model, easy to understand. Red Hat's done a really admirable job of saying, well, we'll give you the bits, sort of, but if you want anything more, if you want support and all that stuff, you come to us. Ease of distribution, you come to us, all that sort of good stuff. So it's a model that isn't, you know, it still isn't fully baked. I mean, they're doing a good job, but it's, it, every open source company you look at is just a little different in that regard. We're still trying to figure out the right recipe for the pudding. So if you're in a state where you've got a project and you've got this open source company behind you and, you and you start playing the game of what would happen if this company died? And you start saying to yourself, we're in deep sneakers if this company dies, then you might want to consider something like a foundation route, Apache Foundation, Linux Foundation, one of these sorts of things, to make sure your project, if it's you know, reasonably sizable, because they don't, they're not going to deal with you know, five guys in a garage type thing, but, but if you've got a reasonably good sizable project and yet it's sort of all hinging on this company, you might want to actually take it the foundation route to make sure that if something happens in the economics, and God knows what the economics in the world are like these days, that the project is going to survive and thrive. Consideration. Lesson seven, in open source there's no such thing as autopilot. This is a real hard lesson for some people to learn. We've always done it that way. Yeah, get over it. Yesterday isn't today, and today won't be tomorrow. Your intent is critical. You have to plan to succeed. Now, once again, in an open source sense, succeeding is not making oodles and gobs of money, but succeeding is making code that people are using, solving problems for folks. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, you start off by doing that neat idea thing and you throw it out there and people say, hey, it's a neat idea, I like playing with it. But if you're gonna go farther than that, you have to start planning a little bit. What's your niche? You know, you have to look at software alone. You know, just because you were first in, another Zen truism, just because you were first in doesn't mean that someone else is gonna come along and say, hey, I got a better idea than that. We'll use that concept and we'll add this to it and we'll make it the powerhouse of things. And what's more, we'll get some giant big company with deep pockets behind us to make sure it happens. Well, suddenly you can find yourself looking at the afterburners of the guy that came after you. So you have to have these things in mind. It's not enough just to have that good technical solution. You've got to have a plan. And if you aren't looking at your whole ecosystem, if you're just sort of throwing it out on the website and saying, oh, you know, pick it up if you want, well, what more can you do? You can talk to the distributions. They're, they're open source guys like you. Say, what would it take from, you know, to, to get you interested in you know, putting it inside your code base? So it's, you know, it's there in the repository. Come on in. So it's there in the repository. These are just, you know, simple discussions to have and can make the world of difference to where your project is going. Because when, once it gets easy to get, it's that much closer to being used by that many more people. Lesson eight, if it ain't growing, it's dying. Remember, this we're talking about an organic situation, living situation. And if you aren't seeing new blood in your project, start having some questions. If you are not seeing input from your users, 
start having some questions. You know, we have to be growing and changing because computing today is not the same as computing 10 years ago. The use of your project today is probably different than your use 10 years ago and will be five years from now. I mean, look at all the stuff going on in cloud. Uh, this is kind of a side thing, but you know, I've been with, with open source stuff long enough that I, I remember the echoes of, well, open source, you know, that's, that's good for imitating innovation of others. But open source does not innovate for that you need a corporation. Chicken chips. If you don't believe that, look at the cloud. Where are the innovations coming in cloud? Open source. Frankly, that's it. And the cloud is changing things, and the cloud's going to change probably most of the projects out there one way or another. The way they get used is going to be a bit different five years from now. Have you thought about it? If you haven't, think about it now. What do you have to do to make yours, your project more cloud friendly? Maybe it's nothing. Maybe it's a simple road, but maybe it's huge. Maybe you need some sort of like web-based interface or something like this, who knows, you know. But think about it. Be aware of these things. You have to make sure that you are constantly moving, that you're constantly growing by some way, shape, or form. And that you're seeing new people. Because if you're not seeing new people, you have to ask the question, why? Is it not interesting? not interesting, that's not good. Is it that it's too hard to get in the door? That's not good either. Because that means that you've somehow insulated yourself. You need to bust open a new door. And the worst thing is if you're not getting new people, you're not getting new ideas. Because people come in with a different perspective. That's one of the beauties of these things. You know, you come to this, you sit in these rooms, and you talk to people you've never seen before, and they're coming from a hugely different viewpoint than you. And if you sit there and you talk with them long enough, you start getting ideas you never had before because their perspective's different. That's the beauty about open source. Here's a slides aside for a second. How many people have gone to a traditional IT sort of presentation and the guy who's wearing a suit that's more expensive than my car stands up front and says, look at what we have done. Applause, applause to me. <laughs> you know, the adulation and worship shall come to me now. That is the exact opposite of what we're doing here. Truth be told, the guy standing up here isn't the guy. He is at best the orchestra leader for the moment. You're making the music. All the music comes from the other people in these chairs. That's the beauty of open source. We are what matter as a community, not the guy up front. And if you don't have that organic community where people are touching each other and talking to each other and finding out what's in their heads, you're missing something. You're missing something. So make sure it's happening. Lesson nine, kind of a corollary to eight. If you're thinking about what it takes to succeed, what you want your project to be, you need to understand where is it going to fit? You may be the only game in town right now, like Zen was. Sooner or later, if it's a really good idea, someone's going to come along and imitate it, and they may have more bucks than you, they may have more marketing savvy than you, they may have some big ass corporation sitting behind them, and suddenly you're in the horse race of your life. So it may not be possible that your solution will be the best solution for every possible uh, situation that comes along. I'll tell you right now, if you're, going to, if you're looking at virtualization and what you want is a, a little pop-up window so that you can put your skunky little Windows desktop in it because there's six pieces of software in there that your corporation requires you to run that just won't run under Wine or whatever, and that's why you want virtualization, you probably don't want to deal with Zen. You might want VirtualBox. VirtualBox is real good with that. You know, pop it in, load it in, zip, there you go. And then you can, you know, use your special little code and everything's right with the world and then throw it back into the bin when you're done or, or throw it in the background and let it hum, whatever you got to do. But it's not the right fit. Something like Zen, 
really is designed for large engagement. That's where it shines anyway. If you've got a bunch of virtualization to do, you should be looking at Zen. If you've got onesie twosies, you may want to look at something else. You have to understand that, though, about your project. What's your weak point? What's your strong point? Who do you need to talk to about that strong point so that even when something else bigger and noisier and glitzier comes along, you still have your wedge, your place in the community because you do something better than they do. You gotta think about that, you gotta know that. So if you haven't done that, think about it. You also have to figure out what your, who your users are and what they need, you know, that, that's, that's basic. But it's true. You wanna succeed, you wanna have a future, I have a clicker that works. Less than 10, competition increases innovation. You know, there are people that say, oh man, you know, you Zen guys, you must really be sore at KVM. You must really hate them. You must really hate those Red Hat guys. No. No, no, no. You, think, you may wish that some people would, you know, choose a different direction about this or that, but, but in the open source world, especially when you have multiple people going for a similar goal, it's iron sharpening iron, man. It's keeping things sharp. It's, that's where the innovation comes from, because you got you know you have to do better. If you don't have the competition, you get stagnation. How many people remember CDE, the Common Desktop Environment? You know, I asked the same question in Texas last week, and I got the same real slow show of hands that I just got here. You almost don't want to admit to it. Um, CDE, for people who didn't see it, was a standardized Unix Windows experience. They standardized on mediocrity. It was oozing with mediocrity. It was, oh. uh, And if I, I can tell a story, um, I knew one of the fellows that was one of the main architects of X11, the X Windows system. And I knew one fellow who worked very closely with me, and this other fellow told me this story. He said, you know, Jim, the guy who worked on X Windows, had this magnificent laugh, this room-filling laugh. You know, you get him started, and it's just the whole room lights up. He was just really cool about that. And he threw himself into the X Windows uh, specification. He wanted something that was powerful. He wanted something that was visible. He wanted something that was just going to be just a gorgeous potential to it. And so he put his heart and soul into it for years, and then, you know, it's coming along on Unix, and then suddenly you have CDE. The episode of mediocrity, just sitting there looking, oh. My friend said, Jim just felt disgusted. It's all that hard work. All that terrific thought that went into making this wonderful, powerful tool. And this is what they built? He said, Jim lost his laugh. It just seemed like he just didn't have his laugh anymore. And then Jim went on to other things. And then in time, Linux came along. And then you had the GNOME KDE wars. You remember that from a few years ago? And it was fighting to see who could make that, that better, that really gorgeous looking lap, uh, desktop environment, that powerful thing. And we can do better, we can do better, we can do better. And someone came and said, hey, Jim, have you seen what they're doing with X these days? And they said, what do you mean? So they plugged in a Linux disk and they said, look at your desktop, Jim. And my friend said, you know what? Jim got his laugh back. He got his laugh back because they were using it. They were starting to have the idea that they could do the stuff that he always dreamed that they could do. They were finally tapping into it. So if you don't have competition, wonder, you know, good ideas bring competition. They do. So be ready for it. And when it comes, embrace it. It's the call to the race, man. This is a chance to go further than you are, that you already are. So be aware of that. It keeps the ball moving. Zen's competition with KVM VMware has pushed the, the hypervisor ball along tremendously. 
because each of us are trying to do better than the other guy. It keeps the ball moving. It's good. And it keeps the project sharp because you can get dull in a hurry, man. You rest on your own laurels. So embrace that competition when it comes. 11, new features. You know, we don't think about it. Two minutes? I want to do it quick. New features are real important because if you're not having new features, I thought we had till the top of the hour. Am I mistaken? Okay, okay. Well, let me, let me accelerate. New features, you don't think about that being important, but that's part of the heartbeat that tells people you're alive. If you're not creating something new, then it's like you must be old. New things are important. I want to get into 12 here real quick. And sometimes perception really is reality. You know, that's hard for tech guys like us to consider. We think of things, the real things are the bits. But someone comes along and says, well, you know, you're, you're passe, you're old hat. You have to change that because otherwise that becomes the truth, whether you believe it or not. If you don't believe that, move up to DC where I am. Man, there's a whole thing of cult of per perception as reality. It's scary as crap for a technical guy. But it's true. So you have to be ready to stand up and fight when it comes your way. As an aside, KVM, Red Hat, KVM, IBM, when all that came down and uh, Red Hat bought Kumranet, which was doing KVM, they did it right. They managed the perception. Why? Because they were doing the right things. They did it right. And now you don't have people saying, well, KVM, that's a, that's a Red Hat, Red Hat owned thing. No, it's out there. It's a project. They are shepherding it along correctly. It's important that the open source world see that you're doing it correctly, and that is perception. This slide, spend time with this slide when you see it on the deck, because I don't have time to go over it now, but you can do a, a whole lot. Shoot your mouth off at places like this about your project. Oh, speaking is hard. No, 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 calculus was hard. Engineering was hard. Speaking you had mastered by the age of five. You're just not used to doing it in front of people. Get used to it. It's not that hard. Because if you're going to, especially if you're going to make a fool of yourself, make a fool of yourself in front of your friends. You know? Other people like you. Do it. It's not that hard. Get an org booth at, you know, these little, at, at these regional shows. Sometimes they're free, sometimes, you know, 50 bucks. Good, but have a bake sale, for crying out loud. Fill it with, you know, CDs. God, people love the CDs. You can do them for cheap, you know. Business cards, you can go to Vistaprint and get 100 million vis uh, business cards for $5 or whatever they're, whatever they're doing, you know. That stuff's easy. A website, blogs, pennies, man. That's just spending the time to do it. Podcasts, go to the Linux Link Tech Show. Great people over there. And even if they've never heard you, if, they, if you got something interesting on the web and say, can you give me 10 minutes some Wednesday night to talk about it, chances are they'll do it if it looks cool. A whole new outlet for you. So, and then, of course, the whole uh, social media thing, demos and tutorials. You know, YouTube videos, when you're talking about something that users are going to use, you may think it's the worst thing in the world. It's the greatest thing since sliced, sliced bread as far as a lot of those people are concerned. Get yourself a cool mascot, but, but we got dibs on the panda. And just shout out and live or shut up and die, man. Talk about it. And uh, the final thing is that you have to work this corporate connection. If you have a corporation that's dealing with you, you must understand what are you doing, what are they doing? What do, what do each one expect from the other? And it's going to look different in just about every case. So you have to have a grip on that situation if you're living with that situation. And you have to manage that relationship between business and the project. Because, man, if your project looks owned, almost in the cracker sort of sense, if it looks owned, people back away from it. You need to have that proper respect, distance, and understanding. Not simple, but very important. And if you don't have it, 
that image may become reality for you, but it's not right, and suddenly you become unright. So you have to have that symbiotic relationship, otherwise you can end up in a fake open source situation. There is a portal that my last job that was nominally open source. We said, great, we'll use this. Then we went to try to hire a couple contractors to do stuff. Trying to find someone who either didn't wear the badge of the company behind that portal or hadn't recently worn a badge of the company behind that portal, almost impossible. Because they weren't dealing with it as an open source community. They were dealing with it like closed source and then kind of throwing it over the wall. So suddenly you wanted anything done, you had to go to that company or someone who was you know, an alumnus of that company. That's not the way it's supposed to be. That's not why we're here. So make sure you've got that relationship correct. Final thoughts, because we're out of time here. Is your code good? Are you reaching out to your users? Is the development community active, engaged, and growing? Are you reaching out here laterally to other people inside the open source community? Do you have, have you worked with your, your libraries and support systems? Is that corporate entity, if, if there is one, is that relationship really healthy? Are there healthy lines between them? And whatever you do, don't give up. Don't give up. Zen had some big hurdles to, come, to overcome. We've done some great things and we're continuing to go forward. You don't have to go this direction. And if you're having problems, solve them. We're geeks, we're used to solving problems. Just recognize them and solve them. Questions inside the remaining three and a half minutes. What's the Okay. <laughs> I don't know if there's a we, we basically went with all the off there. Cloud. We went to KVM based stuff. Uh, having studied it was then two years ago as a hypervisor, it was great. I loved it. Ooh. Oh yeah. But I didn't have that support. You guys are coming back, you're putting effort. What kind of other projects or, or who else is involved in the project is gonna help me be able to migrate things? Now that I have this infrastructure where I'm using Virch and Libvirt and whatnot and Okay, so now you have kernel support, but what about the other tools and things? Um, I, I won't go too, I'll probably want to talk to you a little bit offline here so that we don't tie it up too much, but we actually do have support for, for version liver. It's not quite as good as some of our other tool stacks, but we have multiple tool stacks. We'll talk about that on Sunday too. Uh, but um, yeah, let, let, me, let, let me take you offline because that's a little on the specific side, but yeah, we. We also have, just so people know, we go to zenproject.org, we got the mailing lists, we got the IRC channels, we got all that Q&A infrastructure, all the things that you're expecting and hoping for, we have, and if you don't see something we have, let us know and we'll get it, because that's the way things like this have to be answered. But, uh, you, sir. Okay. Well, um, I don't know, this thing's dangerous. Um, <laughs> well, what did you say, Zen is a very, uh, hardware level oriented company on this side. Have you reached out to your hardware vendors on that side or people on that side or even conversely on the software side building into the cloud stacks like OpenStack and working with CloudStack and the other vendors so you're integrated or the Amazon cloud for you that you do do that? Yeah, there's, there's, uh, we've done some of that, we're doing more. I mean the cloud stack guys, in fact a couple of the cloud stack evangelists that you'll see here at this show are technically in the same group I am. So, I mean, we occasionally like have lunch. Uh, but beyond that, you know, uh, there is the reach out to OpenStack, there is the reach out to CloudStack. That is, we're very mindful of that stuff now. On the hardware side, uh, I, and we'll touch on this Sunday, things like the ARM, ARM architecture, there is a real interesting lot of work going on there and, uh, you know, really a hand in glove fit between Zen architecture and ARM architecture, as it turns out. And, you know, if you've ever seen a, uh, ever see a geek get real excited about architecture, man, that, that was the guy I was talking with who was doing a lot of this work. He said, this is, this is fantastic. It looks like they're designed for each other. And that, as a result, we're gonna have, an, we have, and we're, we will continue to develop a nice tight integration between the two. But yeah, we are mindful of that. In fact, we're part of 
Lenaro, I think we just announced, which is you know, part of the ARM group. So I mean, we are trying to work with that, certainly in, in our side too, AMD and Intel are both on board with the, the Zen project as far as uh, you know, backing members. So yes, we're, we're, we're trying, if you are representing someone that we should be reaching out to and we're not, let us hear. Uh, because we're, we're mindful of doing it. We may not be doing it perfectly, but sure, yeah, absolutely. We wanna be part of the game. Uh, let's see, I think we got like 30 seconds or something left. Uh, any other questions or issues? I wanna thank you all for coming, for staying awake, for being here, for renting an arc or whatever it took for you to get here in all the rain. Um, hope you'll come back to the talk uh, on Sunday. Have a good show. Cloud stacks are everywhere. This is the way to, to better utilize uh, all your resources and it makes managing all your resources pretty easy. All of the innovation is happening in open source. The, the collaborative nature and of the, uh, you know, of the community and, and the speed at which these, uh, these, you know, these, these deficiencies, these bugs are getting discovered and then fixed is a uh, thing that really shows the power of the, you know, of the open source community. It is global and it's definitely because of the users. Community people are extremely friendly and uh, always ready to help. If you go on to IRC any day, you'll see these guys helping each other out and they're all doing it like in a selfless manner. The product is transparent for everyone. Everyone can look at the code base. Um, Everyone can see how CloudStack is, is being built. Nothing, nothing is proprietary. Everything is open. In many ways, it's absolutely vital to the, to the ongoing health of CloudStack. The most exciting event uh, in recent memory for me uh, was our first developer boot camp. Uh, and you know, our call gave people, I think, maybe two weeks notice to come attend. I was expecting 25 or, or 30 people. Uh, so we ended up with uh, 87 <laughs> people uh, and had to go get more chairs uh, into the room twice. Everything within cloud computing is commodity and is open source. And so I, I don't think that you will, uh, you, you'll see anywhere where open source is not pervasive in cloud computing. And so I, I, think, it's, uh, I think it's an assumption. I think. When you talk about cloud computing, you're really talking about open source cloud computing. CloudStack is a robust solution for large deployments. You have dozens of data centers and thousands of servers in each data center. Uh, these um, uh, hardware is going to fail and CloudStack is designed to handle, number one, that mass scale. Number two, it's designed to handle the failure that inevitably happens. Uh, large deployments. We started working on CloudStack over four years ago uh, and you know it was the original set of people working on it uh, had a background of delivering software to telcos and service providers. Lots of QA, lots of users actually using it. High availability is the key feature. Uh, multiple hypervisor support, uh, different network models, you can pick up whatever suits you better. CloudStack management server can be deployed in different physical machines. It definitely has a huge footprint. It's being deployed everywhere. There's a major movie studio that uh, um, they were using CloudStack. They were using it to transcode video. And I thought that was terribly fascinating. What I found more fascinating is what they did during lunch, where they would spin up, uh, you know, 50 or 60 game servers, then as soon as lunch was over, they would destroy all the instances and go back to doing real work. CloudStack is vast. Uh, it touches so many different aspects, and there's no one person that's kind of like a master of all those realms. I think CloudStack as a project is going to be uh, one of the leaders simply because it's some of the most featureful and, and, uh, and robust platforms out there. I don't see any limits to the cloud stack.
When we created Asterisk over a decade ago, we could not have imagined that Asterisk would not only become the most widely adopted open source communication software on the planet, but that it would impact the entire industry in the way that it has. Today, Asterisk has found its way into more than 170 countries and virtually every Fortune 1000 company. The success of Asterisk has enabled a transition of power from the hands of the traditional proprietary phone vendors into the hands of the users and administrators of phone systems. Using this power, our customers have created all sorts of business-changing applications, from small office phone systems to mission-critical call centers to international carrier networks. In fact, there's even an entire country whose communications infrastructure runs on Astros. Digium has always been about creating technology that expands communications capabilities in ways that we could never have imagined. And that's part of what's game-changing about Digium. Today, we're doing it again, this time by introducing a new family of HDIP phones that extends control of the user all the way to the desktop. The launch of these new products represents the next phase in Digium's history of innovation. These are the first and only IP phones designed to fully leverage the power of Asterisk. When we first discussed our expectations for building a family of phones for use with Asterisk, our requirements were pretty simple. We asked the team to build the phones such that they were easy to install, integrate, provision, and use. I think you'll soon agree our engineers have delivered on that goal. User feedback is validating that when it comes to operation with Astro Space Systems, including our own SwitchFox based product, these are the easiest to use, best integrated, most interoperable products on the market today. The Digium family of phones will initially include three IP desk phones, uniquely designed to complement any Asterisk or SwitchFox based solution. These phones are different for a number of reasons. First, they're exclusively designed for use with Asterisk. Secondly, we've made it really easy to auto-discover and provision the phones. Next, we've made it easy for the phones to access information inside of Asterisk, allowing tight coupling between an application and the phone. Additionally, we've created an applications engine that allows users and developers to create and run their own apps on the phone. And finally, we've done all of this at a very compelling price point. At Digium, we're always thinking of ways to give our customers the best value in business phone systems and also give them the power to create their own solutions for any communications challenge. We'll continue to push the boundaries, not only to make Asterisk cooler and faster and more technologically feature rich, but to make Asterisk and VoIP communications even easier. And together, we'll change the way the world communicates. Again. Your customers rely on your website or application. If it's slow or non-responsive, it infuriates your users and costs you money. Keeping your business-critical systems humming along requires insight into what they're doing. Your system metrics tell stories, stories that can reveal performance bottlenecks, resource limitations, and other problems. But how do you keep an eye on all of your system's performance metrics in real time and record this data for later analysis? Enter Longview, the new way to see what's really going on under the hood. The Longview dashboard lets you visualize the status of all your systems, providing you with a bird's eye view of your entire fleet. You can sort by CPU, memory, swap, processes load, and network usage. Click a specific system to access its individual dashboard, then click and drag to zoom in on choke points and get more detail. Comprehensive network data, including inbound and outbound traffic, is available on the Network tab, and Disk Writes and Free Space on the Disks tab, while the Process Explorer displays usage statistics for individual processes. The System Info tab shows listening services, active connections, and available updates. Adding Longview to a system is easy. Just click the button, copy the one-line installation command, then run the command on your Linux system to complete the process. The agent will begin collecting data and sending it to Longview. Then the graphs start rolling. Use Longview to gain visibility into your servers, so when your website or app heats up, it stays up.
Most enterprises today realize that usernames and passwords alone aren't enough to keep their network safe from unauthorized intrusions. That's why two-factor authentication has gotten so popular lately. It adds that extra layer of protection enterprise networks need to stay safe. But what you may not know is that some two-factor authentication solutions, they're better than others, like two-factor strong authentication with Wicked. Wicked goes beyond other authentication systems by being less expensive, easier to implement, and easier to use, giving you software-based token clients built to run on all major devices and OSs, including iOS and Android. These tokens utilize a public-private key combination that's generated on device, so there aren't any shared secrets flying around for attackers to hijack, or which require any special handling. Instead, all keys are kept secure and private between the requesting token and your server, which you control in-house, making it the most secure way possible to perform authentication encryption. And with an extensive, flexible API and support for protocols like LDAP and RADIUS, Wicked works with any enterprise network architecture to protect the IT systems vital to your enterprise. Download your Wicked free trial today. Regardless of whether you're considering two-factor authentication for the first time, or just ready to ditch your existing expensive key fob system, we can help with easy-to-implement, easy-to-use, strong authentication. From Wicked.